No. I'm telling you, this is gonna be great. I've got all the recording equipment here, you've got all the video equipment there. We can just do it at the same time. Gotta be honest, I'm not really loving this idea. Yeah, like every time we do something like this, it ends badly for us. There was that time I was in the TV when we reviewed the Ruby Spears cartoon, and I wound up getting turned into Evil Ben. And the time I was in the TV when we did the second season of NT Warrior, and you and I both got attacked by Evil Ben. Yeah, remember that, John? Oh, awkward. Um, are you still evil? I think I'm good. You look terrible. It's been a long year, Ben. Come on, guys. Give me a break. I gotta get all this stuff set up anyway, and we gotta finish the Thousandth Mega Man episode, so let's just do it. Watch. I can even do the intro. It's gonna be great. Is this it? Am I doing it right? I fell. Access? Oh, uh, yeah, after season two, they started to go with subtitles instead of just season numbers. Made it a little easier to remember which season it was. Plus, the numbers kind of stopped being aligned with the game since this one was based off of Battle Network 4. And there's an X in the name, so it's also extreme, but not Mega Man Extreme. That's different, although that's also about robots on the internet. Shit. This isn't helping. Can we just do this and get it over with? Yeah, we should probably get started. There's 51 episodes this season, so it's going to take us a while. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, I'm starting to have second thoughts about that. Too late! We open the season with Mega Man fighting the Mario Brothers, but it looks like he's having some trouble. Well, it looks like Mega Man is done for. Yeah, he can't withstand the power of the Sledgehammer Brothers. He's too wimpy. Yeah, right! Huh? He has more power in his little finger than they do in their whole body. That's because you know what I can do with my little finger. Saucy. Well, it looks like Rubik's Cubes were the answer, and Mega Man takes these two goons out. Hey, isn't that Dex's little brother? What's he doing here if Dex isn't? Wait, where is Dex? Earlier, Dr. Hikari materialized Cyberdata in the human world. Now he hopes to materialize a net navi into the body of a net op. It's a procedure that he calls cross fusion. Oh, God, that ridiculous Ghostbusters life virus episode is apparently canon. Let's just move on and check out the latest invention from Scilab the Synchro Chip. Looks pretty cool, huh? I guess the idea is that the net op is supposed to be able to fuse together with their net navi and fight as one. That honestly sounds more difficult than normal, but hey. Masaki here is trying to cross use with his net navi. Uh. Prison man. Prison man? It doesn't go so well, and after an awkwardly tender moment between Dr. Hikari and Mail, Beast Man attacks! Savage Man, and I'll be the one deleting you if you keep trying to stop me. Sorry, Savage Man attacks! These name changes are getting annoying. Oh man, it's Dr. Claw! No, this is Dr. Claw! No, this is Dr. Claw! No, this is Patrick! Well, uh, while we fight about that, a satellite poops out a missile that creates a dimensional area around Scilab, a space where the real world and the cyber world are one, and viruses and net navvies can coexist, which is how Vincent Price Shade Man over here arrives to steal Scilab's stock of synchro chips. Luckily, he drops two of them, and Land scoops one up, cross-using with Mega Man in order to fight. Lan thinks it was all a dream, but finds out quickly what really happened, and rushes off to Scilab, where they inspect the damage from the day before, wondering if Mr. Wily was behind it all, or someone else. Since you have to start from ground zero in every game, why not in every season too? Style change is out of the question now, because cross-fusion and double soul are the only way. Until later, but that's not important. They want to study the effects of cross-fusion on Lan and Mega Man first, and I'm over here wondering why the hell they aren't studying this freak of nature rush over here, since he can warp in and out of the cyber world at will. Savage Man attacks again, and uh, is it just me, or are they reusing a lot of footage already? I mean, it's only episode two, for Christ's sake. At least Shade Man's getting something good out of this, finishing up his Palace of Darkness as a headquarter for him and his Darkloid buddies, while Lan gets invited to join the Net Savers. So, is it normal protocol for Net Savers to go on field trips? Um, yes? This is one of the weird issues with this season of the show. Be prepared for a lot of its plot to revolve an unusual amount around field trips and hot springs. I swear, the first half of the show is like 30% that. Wait, hey, what's Chisau doing here? He's like half their age. Get him out of there. <laughs> Aw, thanks. Oh, hey, while I'm on the subject of shit that doesn't go away, you should expect this about once in episode two. Mr. Famous! 
Please call me famous. It's fucking hilarious. Oh, God, Bubble Man. What did they do to you? You look like Mega Man from Captain N. Hey, speaking of, you remember Savage Man and Shade Man? Turns out they're both voiced by Scott McNeil, the voice of Dr. Wily and Proto Man in both the Ruby Spears cartoon and Captain N. Bubble Man is weird in this show. He's sort of the comedic relief, but he's also a bad guy. So you somehow get into this routine where he's mugging on camera for a while, then poses a medium level threat for the good guys, then goes and acts sillier on Shade Man. It's a, it's a tough dynamic. I'm not really sure how I feel about it. Mega Man is eventually able to deal with Bubble Man, but this is far from the last we'll be seeing of him this season. And on the more threatening side of things, let's see what Flash Man can do. Oh, is it that time already? <laughs> Please, Mega Man, we can't quit now! Mega Man, please get up! Ah! Oh, yikes. Okay then, uh, maybe Mega Man can use some help. Or, you know, the doctor. When Flash Man reports on the mission status, Shade Man gives him a dark chip. Now in the game, these are chips that grant the user immense power at the cost of their health. But in the show, it doesn't really seem to correspond to any specific move. It just makes them really, really strong all on their own. Is this sex? I think this is sex. I'm pretty sure this is sex, because I this is what I, I this is what I had last night. No, this is double soul. No, this is Patrick. The other big utility this season is that when Mega Man makes a strong connection to another Navi, it makes a double soul chip Lan can use to help him get through tough battles. It comes up a lot. And so do Hot Springs. Did I mention that already? You did. Well, we're on field trip number two, headed to Hot Springs number one, and I'm not keeping count because I'd sooner walk into oncoming traffic. Oh, wow. Bubble Man is already back, too. You weren't kidding. They really do cycle through the same stuff a lot this season. So while the kids are on this field trip, it looks like Lan's not much of a fan of anything he can't jack into, which pisses off, hello there. John, meet Tama. Oh, uh, not yet. First, we need this insane exchange. You can't go in yet. Not until you follow this old tradition they have. You have to taste the water to compare its quality to other hot springs. What? We want to bathe in it, not drink it. Before you dip your balls in this water, you need to drink it so you can identify what everyone else's balls taste like. Anyway, John, meet Tamako. She's pissed and ready to battle land anytime, anywhere. I'm ready. No, in the in the show, John. <laughs> Rush, not now. Mega Man, come on, buddy. Really? It looks like every time these two try to fight, Bubble Man keeps fucking it all up, mostly for himself, but he keeps doing just kind of harmlessly annoying things that keep the battle from finishing. And then it's Mega Bubble Man with a uh, bubble body. I, I got nothing. Props for ingenuity, I guess, but Heavy Metal Man is able to pop his bubble pretty easily and the threat is eliminated. And then Bowl Man gets an episode. Prepare to despise the game you love, humans. Mega Man Battle Network? Yeah, maybe let's skip this one. Next up, we get World 3 showing back up again with Mr. Match specifically helping deal with the threat of Vine Man on the net. The battle winds up damaging Heat Man more than expected, though, and Mr. Famous needs to step in to help fix him. In a nice send-up to the last season, it turns out that some of Torchman's data still lives on in Heat Man, and when it looks like Heat Man may not make it on his own, Famous is able to help bring Torchman back, who beats Vine Man like it's fucking nothing. Maybe Pac-Man here can teach us about space! I'm Techno! Wait, like, from Mega Man Extreme? I knew it! They are connected! Give me an S! Eh, good enough. Oh good, another field trip? We're playing the Think, Link, and Get Sync game. The Think, Link, and Get Sync game? So how do you uh, play that? Quit yakking! Oh Jesus, the sign is alive! This episode's kind of... lame. Savage Man shows up again and uses mirrors to trick Mega Man, but he decides to use them right back on Savage Man, which doesn't really make sense. Wouldn't he already know what's real and what's fake? Hey, Chod is here though, so that's... a thing. Hey, so is Guts Man. Looks like he's squaring off against the World 3 Navvies. Uh, um, do, do you know what was... I, I got nothing. Wait, is Dex joining World 3? This is kind of fucked up, guys. And, uh, hey, Dex, is that a body pill? What? No, what are you doing to Cheese Ow? No! Yeah, turns out Dex still holds a grudge against Lan for beating him, so he straight up joined a former terror cell to get stronger. Great call, man. Yeah, I don't know, they don't seem too thrilled with him right now. Well, regardless, they need to have their fight, which, of course, is right in the vicinity of the latest Dark Lloyd attack, this time from Burner Man. It takes a long slugfest and a little chest bonding, but between Gutsman and Gutsoul, they're able to take Burner Man down. Dex is still a dick, though. 
Meanwhile, in the land of underground net battles, we have NT Warriors' interpretation of Ian fighting off-brand decks. They have themselves a little fight, and this guy decides to try out Dark Chip, which wins him the fight, but loses control of his net navi, who entirely deletes his opponent in front of everyone. And hello, sexy Miss Mari. Where are you going all of a sudden? And why is her hair a croissant? Wait, no, now it's a cinnamon bun. Hmm. That's not important. Ms. Mari is trapped in a big freezer and Lan needs to get her out. So he sends Mega Man to fight Spike Man, ultimately unlocking the freezer and freeing her. Why, why are you still fighting, guys? You're, you're done. Lan, here. Why don't you try this? But that's a dark chip. Where'd you get that? That doesn't really matter now, does it, Lan? If you use this chip, you can save Mega Man. Or Jack out? You don't need to fight anymore, get the fuck out of there. Well, at least Lan has the brains to refuse the dark chip, and when he calls out that Miss Mari would never force him to do something like that, she reveals her true identity. The name's Missouri, kid, and you should really have taken me up on my offer. It was Mega Man's only chance to survive. So edgy. And this was like just some rando teacher in the first game. Bit of a weird interpretation there. The next episode opens on Bubble Man trying to steal a safe from the real world and doesn't know it's locked. You know, like a safe. He doesn't have much luck, but Burner Man comes back later and has little trouble cutting through to obtain the dark chip metal stored within. While all this is going on, Scilab is testing the idea of allowing Lan to enter dimensional areas by cross-fusing at the exact moment he reaches the edge. It, uh, might take a little while to get it right. Lan and Mega Man aren't the only ones fighting for the good guys this season. This is Search Man, and he's got a bit of a feud going on with Shadow Man. See, he's been hired by Nebula to take out Control X, a series of traffic control systems with sensors that can detect anomalies in the air and space. It turns out Nebula has a cloaked satellite station that would be susceptible to discovery as long as Control X is around, so they waste no time trying to wipe it out. And while Shadow Man is a powerful Navi all on his own, using dark chips as tools to infect random security Navi seems like a solid strategy too. Search Man seems a little... Aggressive in his tactics, though. While Mega Man tries to save anyone infected by the dark chips, Search Man doesn't give a fuck. You ask me why I deleted them? I ask you, was there any other choice? I don't know, but you didn't even try to find one. There might have been some way to save those guys. Even the good can't be saved after a dark chip corrupts them. There's only deletion. You're... Realistic. Why are you doing this? Because you need to understand that pieces of shit like this ruin people's lives. Killing him's not going to bring anybody back. No, but it will keep him from hurting anybody else. No, I won't do it again, I swear. I'm going to kill! Down. Well, at least he's able to take care of the threat of Shadow Man. When he has Mega Man cornered, Search Man is able to use his ability to fire between entire networks and rather morbidly tear off limbs, ending in Shadow Man's deletion. Unfortunately, the damage is done, leaving Control X in rough shape, but not destroyed. At least Lan stumbles onto a dark chip warehouse in the next episode, delivering a pretty serious blow to Nebula, but also resulting in a bit of an ego from Lan. I suspected something was up. After all, I am the super fast, always ready, totally awesome, and great ultimate net saver. <laughs> Your title gets longer every time you say it. Unfortunately, this ends up leading him into a trap, where after opening the briefcase from Pulp Fiction and discovering it was full of sand the whole time, he finds himself attacked by Desert Man, who, while he is a pretty powerful Dark Lloyd, has an unusual sort of weakness. You realize I can absorb anything you can dish out? Just as I thought. While he's absorbing the water, he can't move. Aqua Sword! Battle chip in! Cool idea. Doesn't work though, and Desert Man just comes right back. It takes Chode cross-using with Proto Man to take him down, but this won't be the last we see of Desert Man either. I, uh, I think we should skip the next few. Uh, the first up is an episode where Yai finally shows up again, and it includes this. Okay, maybe not that last bit, but it does feature Yai's company producing a video game starring Yai as Princess Chai. Why? It also has this shot that I swear just reminds me of the flying robo-shark scene from the first season, but I digress. Then there's the one where Dex is a delivery boy for World 3 and buys some weird thing called a net wrecker that makes Gutsman turn into some kind of King Kong monster. I mean, it is neat that the net wrecker was built by this timeline's version of Dr. Light, Lance's grandfather as a kid, but outside that, this episode's just weird. They use mushrooms to make Gutsman sleepy and he falls off a building and everything's just fine. After that, it's another fucking tournament! I thought you said Battle Network 4 was the end of tournaments, Rick! Uh, well... Um, we have the worst luck ever. I don't 
don't know about that. I mean, look at Shuko. Bad luck just seems to follow her wherever she goes. Higsby is terrified of her since her mere presence seems to make just bad things happen. Also, she loves rice, like a weird amount. If you're good enough, you could win the grand prize, a 10 pound bag of rice. Oh, 10 old pounds of rice. What could be better? Oh, wow. If I could just win that prize, then my family would eat like kings. What kind of prize is rice? The tasty kind. Well, let's get this tournament underway. Oh my god, this little guy is so cute. So, I guess this is this this is Okay. <clears throat> so I guess this is Spellman, Shuko's Navi. He's not much of a fighter, but lucky for him, the rest of the competitors are so distracted by how adorable Spoutman is that they completely screw up their net battles and leave Spoutman as the winner. Really? That's the first time ever! Hey, congratulations, Shuko! Oh, thank you, Spoutman! I couldn't have won without you! So Shuko wins the rice! <laughs> but she doesn't have a rice cooker. So Higsby loans her one, and then the power goes out. Shuko is convinced it is all her fault, but according to Higsby, it's kind of just a planned outage while they upgrade the systems. Doesn't stop her from crying, and Spellman from crying, and her from crying because Spellman is crying. Oh boy. Clearly, the only solution is to attack the power grid to save it. And oh, it worked. Huh. Everything is right with the world. Found it. All navvies prepare to delete the intruder. So, yeah, that's a problem. Anyway, Spoutman gets nervous and cries so much it starts flooding the system until Mega Man learns Number Soul and fixes the situation, leaving these electrical engineers to get back to their weird porn. Now we're safe again. So much for leaving early today, no? I know, yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm definitely putting in for some overtime today, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that's great and all, but is there like a plot? coming any time this season? Plot? Story? Storyline? Cohesive storyline in the in the show? Plot? Plot? Yeah, honestly none of this makes any sense to me. It seems like every episode forgets what happens in the last episode. All right, all right fine. Well, let's dig back into the plot then cuz this is the episode where that finally starts to happen. No, what episode is that? 17. We're a third of the way through and we're just getting to the plot. Savage Man is knocking out power at a convenience store, but quickly returns to Nebula to get more dark chips. Over the next five episodes, we start to see that, like with the games, dark chips do come at a price. Using dark chips has eroded my data. Now I need them to replace what I've lost. So give me another one. Oh, weird. It almost sounds like steroid abuse. The more they use it, the more they need it, and the more violent they end up. Not only that, when they finally use too much, they become corrupted with a soul of darkness. Which, Jesus, there's something really spooky unsettling about how they change. In the next episode, we finally get to meet Searchman's operator, the cold analytical Rika. Not to be confused with the cold analytical Chode, who gets to show off his skills in a battle with Video Man. Video Man is pretty much the shit poster of net battlers, since he can seemingly manipulate the space around him entirely, and ends up pretty much dominating Land and Mega Man. But Rika proves you don't have to cross fuse to beat the Dark Lloyds, and eliminates the dimensional area generator, sending Video Man back to the net. When Desert Man attacks and threatens to delete Mega Man, Rika orders Search Man to take the shot anyway. Search Man relents just long enough to figure out how to save Mega Man and beat Desert Man. They work together and create Search Soul, sending Desert Man into such a rage that he starts furiously consuming dark chips, allowing himself to be caught before ultimately succumbing to the soul of darkness himself. So Shade Man sends Flash Man to clean up the mess, but is taunted by the dying Desert Man that it will happen to him too, and winds up getting beaten by Shoud Crossfuse with Proto Man. Upon his return, he discovers that he too is becoming corrupted, begging Shade Man for more and attacking him, leaving Shade Man no choice but to delete him too. Having seen what the Dark Chips are doing to his Dark Lloyds, Shade Man decides enough is enough and plans to steal the remaining chips from Nebula itself, launching a full-on assault on another Dark Chip warehouse. But when he finally arrives, he discovers just a single Dark Dark chip in the middle of the floor, and has it suggested strongly by Miss Yuri that Nebula is aware of Shade Man's betrayal. Then Lan and Shoud decide to pick a fight with Shade Man, who honestly doesn't have a serious beef with either of them and just wants to leave. He takes them out pretty quickly and leaves, but it should be pretty clear that Shade Man is after Nebula, not them. This is the first piece of real story to happen so far this season, and while other tiny fragments from other episodes do factor in later, this is the first time it felt like something was really happening. Yeah, it seems like there's a growing fracture between Nebula and the Dark Lloyds. We find out that Nebula has been intentionally poisoning them so that by the time all the dirtier work is done, there's no mess to clean up. 
Sounds like a pretty flimsy plan, since all it took was a few of them getting sick for Shaban to figure out what was really going on. He's got to be planning something bigger, right? Oh, sure. That's why the next episode is about Bubble Man realizing that friendship is a core component of Double Soul and desperately tries to make friends. No, no. Hang on. What? Yeah, he tries making friends with, like, everybody. Random Dark Lloyds, Shade Man, Number Man, Roll. Eventually, Spout Man befriends him, because of course he does, and when the other Navvies split up to look for him, Ice Man winds up hanging out too, helping them sell ice water to Navvies since they get thirsty. These dudes can walk around in the real world, and you're stuck on them being thirsty? Yeah. They build an ice fort on the beach, get tricked into fighting Mega Man, Roll, and Number Man, but everyone leaves pretty amicably, and the three water dudes are good friends, despite Bubble Man constantly trying and failing to double soul with them. So you're saying they bury the lead on the plot again, like, right away. Yeah, the last episode is pretty important, and then they go and have a sort of beach episode. Let's see. The next one gives us Dr. Regal, which is totally a normal name for a totally normal dude that we totally haven't seen admit to being a bad guy and thrown off a huge tower in the games. Then there's another Hot Spring episode starring Hitler, where Lan hangs out near Molten Rock without collapsing immediately. And after that, we have Video Man making a whole bunch of Mega Man holograms to go infect VHS tapes and wreak havoc on whoever plays a copy. Oh, and then he makes copies of Bubble Man for some reason? Twice? I, I don't get it. I guess Lan's really into some unnamed movie, but his copy was wiped out by magnetic interference. Why is he doing that? Does that happen when you do it? Uh-oh. What is wrong with you? Why is he doing that when you do that? You're magnetized! I feel like all we've done on this trip is wait for stuff to happen. Seriously, we've been at this for, what, 20 minutes now? And I feel like nothing's happened all season. Half season. Huh? Uh, half season? This is this is halfway through the season. Do something! All right, okay, uh, how about a sort of mid-season finale? Nebula enlists in the help of a girl named Anetta, who acts as a mole in order to corrupt Proto Man with a hidden dark chip. It sounds like she has some issues in her past, and after getting fake rescued by the net savers, she hides the chip in Chode's PET, in the hopes he'll use it without looking. Miss Yuri trips the fire alarm at the hospital, causing its protocols to suck all the oxygen out for some reason! But Chode manages to help guide Proto Man through a battle against Spike Man without using the chip anyway. Way, noting that he's been using his chip so much that he knows what each one feels like by now. It's at this point that Chode reveals he remembers Anetta from an incident six months before. She'd been hospitalized after a bad car crash and was told by her doctor she'd probably never walk again. But her navvy silk kept pushing her to work hard on her recovery and in time she was able to start moving around again. But a freak fire suddenly engulfed the building, destroying its door mechanisms and trapping hundreds of patients inside. Despite repeated pleas from Anetta and Proto Man alike, Silk insisted she stay behind, woven into the door mechanism to make sure everyone can escape. Anetta had been blaming Shout for Silk's deletion the whole time, but now understood that things were different than how they seemed at the time. The somber moment doesn't last long as Anetta gets kidnapped. Anetta! And Lan and Chode give chase, with Chode even telling Lan to his face that he can't do this alone and needs his help. They take a helicopter and wind up finding an oil tanker out on the water, where Shade Man had opened up yet another assault on Nebula. Miss Yuri leads Lan and Chode to the leader of Nebula, who reveals his plan to control or destroy the Dark Alloids, who now secretly work for him instead of for Shade Man. It turns out World 3 was also working on dimensional area technology when they were defeated, and he assumes Shade Man used their old hideout as his own base of operations to facilitate his attacks on Nebula. Oh hey guys, it's Shade Man. He's here to destroy Nebula once and for all. So, hey, guys, you want to maybe not throw yourself between Shade Man and Nebula again? How is their mutual destruction not a good thing for you? The two of them wind up both using a program advance on him, but only take off one arm as the Nebula leader disappears, replaced by Laser Man. He soon has the dimensional area generators on the ship destroyed, forcing Shade Man to log out, but not before he tries destroying the ship's power source one last time. And since they literally cannot keep themselves away when they don't have to fight, Lan and Chode send Mega Man and Proto Man in to fight, getting their asses absolutely thrashed. Lan realizes there's only one option left, the Dark Chief. Yep. Psych! Chow gives Proto Man the dark chip, powering him up, but immediately corrupting him. He's able to give Mega Man his Proto Soul in time to defeat Shade Man, but Proto Man flees the battle as well, leaving Chode behind alone. And if things weren't bad enough, Shade Man returns to his palace of darkness to find Laser Man has usurped him, stealing all his Dark Lords and imprisoning him in a void within the palace. Shit. That was a real downer ending for everybody. Laser Man's in charge, Proto Man's MIA, and Shade Man's attack was for nothing. What do we do now? A fashion show! No. No!
Eve Morshan has developed some kind of wearable computer that does literally way too much for it to be legal, including completely masking your identity, allowing someone like Ms. Yuri to pretend to be Ms. Morshan and try to steal aerospace data. Wait, why doesn't she just steal the wearable computer? Wouldn't that be like way, way more useful for day-to-day -day stuff? I mean, why not both? I guess if they steal the aerospace data, it'll be harder to find the satellite, right? Just about anything helps them at this point, including Lan and Chode fighting after two straight episodes of everyone sucking his dick with condolences. I think Lan's apologized like four separate times now for what happened to Proto Man, and Chode's sick of it. If one of them had to be taken by the soul of darkness, then Mega Man was the better choice, since Proto Man and I are more capable net savers. We would have been able to delete Shade Man, not just log him cool out. Cool it, Chod! Come on, you must know that what I'm saying is the truth. Proto Man is the stronger Navi. He could have defeated the Dark Lloyds, I know it. That's why Mega Man should have been taken by the soul of darkness. I know you're upset, but stop saying that! What, that Mega Man should have been taken by the soul of- Stop Ugh. acting this way! He does ultimately admit that giving Proto Man the dark chip was his fault, and works hard to make sure that Proto Man can't hurt anyone while he's corrupted. An attack on Scilab brings Proto Man within seconds of stealing data for Chowd's new PET prototype that would filter out the effects of dark chips, but Chowd is able to extract it all just in time, leaving Proto Man going back to Laser Man with nothing, and he is not happy. You cannot accept failure. That is something we must change about you. Uh, in fact, I'm going to change everything about you. Chip data I'm just giving you is unlike any other. It still turns you into a darkloid, but instead of eroding your data, it rewrites it, turning you into a completely new Navi, one I control. With you by my side, leading my other minions, nothing can stand in our way. We shall finally complete our goal of taking over the human world. A world that will tremble in fear at your name, Dark Proto Man. And just to throw things off again, the next episode is about Spout Man becoming obsessed with Mega Man after he saves him from corrupted navvies. This episode doesn't really have much of a point, outside Mega Man obtaining Spout Soul, along with the really fucking graphic deletion of Burner Man. And then we have another hot spring episode, where the hot spring- Oh god, it's a spaceship, they're going to space, what the fuck? Oh, uh, yeah, Yai's family's weather satellite's been getting whacked with some random debris, so she just straight up kidnapped her friends to go into space and fix it. It's... Junk Data Man. He lives in a little magnetic satellite. They teach him what's okay to take and what not to take. Uh, okay. The next one sees the return of Commander Beef. Except it turns out that literally everyone on the show knows the net agents have been Mesa, Miyu, and Sal all along. Everyone except Lance, Higsby, and Mari. Oh, fucking come on! Another episode about a stupid love triangle? It also weirdly features Mr. Gauss in a one-off cameo, ending in a weird Spartacus moment where, like, the entire cast wears Commander Beef costumes and... All right, let's see if I get this right. They all pretend to pretend to be Commander Beef. It's weird. I feel ridiculous. Do you think he's buying it? Why not? After all, the man is wearing a dress and holding a fish captive. What's happening? I'm confused. What are you guys doing up there? And what's with the Commander Beef costumes? There's one for you, too. I always did want one of these, but wait. Why are you giving this to me now? Of course. You must not have heard the news, Lan. The mayor has declared today to be Commander Beef Day. Everybody's wearing the costume in honor of all the great deeds he's done for Dentex City. Wow, that's pretty cool. But hey, at least we made it to the second mini arc of the series. Oh, finally. What is this one about? Well, these four episodes sort of focus on changing up how net battling works with all this dimensional area stuff going on. First up is the Battle Chip Gate, a machine that helps land bypass the restrictions of battling while using cross fusion. So normally, Lan has to load up his PET with whatever chips he wants before he cross fuses with Mega Man. If he doesn't, like earlier, in the season, he has no chips at his disposal. But even if he does, he runs the risk of running out, too. The battle chip gate allows another person to send chip data to land to use while crossfuse. In a way, it sort of turns the crossfuse operator into a net navvy themselves, while the person with the battle chip gate now acts as their operator. The other new tech we get to see come into play is the dark synchro chip, which Yuri gives to Misaki under the guise of net police officer Manuela in order to... <laughs> come on. Net police officer Manuela, in order to let him crossfuse with Prisman, the result is pretty scary. Dark synchro chip in download! Crossfusion! <laughs> How did he do that? See it, 
chumps. I have more important business to handle. Seeing as dark synchro chips use dark chips as their main power source, this means those chips can even affect humans, and Misaki and Prisman both start going crazy, robbing banks and causing mayhem for no reason but fun. It ultimately results in Mega Man and Prism Man fighting in a small dimensional area, and both destroying each other's chess pieces, ending the cross fusion for both, and severely damaging their PETs. Mega Man's in a bad, bad way. Not only that, now there's even more Dark Lloyds! How many of these guys are there going to be this season anyway? Whatever. Raul and Raika work together to take down a handful of the new Dark Lloyds, while Scilab finishes off the PET-2, a sturdier device that should make cross-fusing a lot more stable and safe for both parties. Unfortunately, Lan and Mega Man do so well that they start to get a bit of an ego. So Chowd and Raul dress up like disco dancers to pretend to be Dark Lloyd operators and teach Lan a lesson. No. What? That's really stupid. Why can't he just say he's being an asshole and deal with it? I, I mean, it's, it's just a kid's show, John. Come on, it's- Kids are stupid, too. All right, fine. Uh... Okay, here's one where uh, Mega Man uses a regular old wind chip and then it flies him off to another country where he has to double soul with Wind Man in order to stop a hurricane from destroying everything. What? None of that makes any sense. Yeah, it sounds kind of dumb. I'm going to say pass. Okay, uh, let's see. There's one where Sparkman tries to crash a train, but then Mega Man and Woodman work together and make Wood Soul to stop him there, too. Go to hell. Oh, how'd you know the name of the episode? What? Yeah, this one's Go to Hell, or Go to Hell by Train? I kind of like that one better. Keep moving. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Lan goes to Russia, sorry, Sharo, to stop Fridge Man from taking over a rare metal mine. These Navi names are so dumb. Oh, okay. Uh, this one's kind of a weird one. What's weird about it? So, I mean, it starts out the kind of same as everything else with a bunch of cameos from other characters from earlier seasons, but it's like Shining Man and Whale Man in them. It turns out a bunch of navvies that participated in the N1 Grand Prix back in season one are getting kidnapped shortly after they visit an arcade in town. Looks like there's a virus busting game everyone's been participating in, and since the Grand Prix navvies are pretty damn strong, they keep winning and getting themselves captured. When Roll gets taken away, she finds the navvies are being forced by a disembodied voice to compete in a delete battle tournament, where the losing navvy, well, Gets deleted. In the end, it turns out the voice was a robot named Allegro. But what's really weird about it is that it was built by Kid Grave. Wait, no. Hang on. I thought Kid Grave was actually a robot. I thought Kid Grave was Bass. Yeah, he is. Apparently, Bass used Kid Grave to build Allegro as a sort of little brother. But after attracting too much attention, Bass just casually kills him right in front of the kids. It's really fucked up. Dark Proto Man shows up in the dimensional area to offer Base a role in Nebula, but he turns down the offer in disgust, wanting nothing to do with any human organization. Alright, that's weird, but at least it feels like something is happening. What's next? Uh. Male has a dream about cross fusing with Roll, and then doesn't. Yeah, I had a dream about cross fusing with Roll. Uh. Lan teaches a bunch of old people how to net battle, fights Top Man. Rick. Uh, let's see. Oh, Lan and Melu find an old ruins and try to help out a genie. It's Mist Man. Uh, Rush goes off on his own and befriends one of those pink sheep viruses. All right, fuck it. Let's just go to the last six episodes already. They form a loose final arc for the season, and it starts with Raul and Chowd finally tracking down the location of Dr. Eagle's secret base. Turns out it's in space. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that seems normal. Totally right, space. Turns out that the tanker Shade Man attacked earlier in the season had a satellite launch pad on board, so Chowd's been keeping an eye out for any suspicious spacecraft. It's completely invisible, which, okay, sure, that'll make it harder to find, but Chowd figures that even if it's invisible, it still has to be affected by gravity, so he starts scanning the Earth's orbit for any anomalies. He also realizes his satellite theory explains why Nebula tried to destroy Control X earlier on, too, since it could theoretically not just help them locate it, but possibly take full control of it, too. So naturally, Every Dark Lloyd from the entire season is revived by Laser Man, and they all attack Control X. It's a fucking boss rush! Every time! Oh, don't be dramatic. They're apparently just there for show since Mega Man and company have no real trouble taking them all down. Oh, good. Another dimensional area. I'm guessing that means Dark Proto Man is here, right? Ah, yeah. Right on cue. Turns out the Dark Lloyd attack was a distraction, so Mega Man would be elsewhere when he went to attack Chow directly. And not a moment too soon, since he finally pinpointed the exact location of the satellite. Dark Proto Man destroys the data and leaves, but Aneta manages to remember the necessary bits and reboots the computer to give them what they need again. Hey guys, you remember Bubble Man? Yes. Yeah, weren't there like... three of him? 
Did that ever get resolved? Nope. Anyway, he spent the entire second half of this season just trying to figure out how to dig Shade Man out from his rock tomb, courtesy of Laser Man, until Bass suddenly shows up and lets him out. Turns out he has an interest in the Dark Lords as well and needs them to survive. That's great and all, but with Dr. Regal destroying all the planet's defense satellites, I'm not sure Dark Lords are what's important right now. How is anything supposed to be able to fight Regal now? Well, it turns out Lan has a plan. Wow, Dex looks like a retired gangster. Anyway, the kids decide to take Yai's space shuttle up to Regal's secret ship, but since it's invisible, it's causing them a few problems. Like how it can just fire lasers from out of nowhere and fuck with Junk Data Man's debris collection. I mean... Yeah, I guess that counts. Mega Man tries to help and winds up being granted Junk Soul. Oh, ew, God. Ugh, Jesus, no. Ew. And a dimensional area surrounds both Yai's ship and Regal's. Lan's the only one on board who can cross you, so he wraps himself up in literal bubble and floats on over to confront Regal, who summons Dark Proto Man to fight. Oh, that's weird. When he touches Lan's chest piece, it starts to sort of absorb his dark aura? Dark Proto Man doesn't seem happy with it either. Dr. Regal decides enough is enough and dismisses the dimensional area, locking Dark Proto Man out and forcing Lan out of his cross fusion, so he's on his own when Regal starts to destroy the ship around him. Things are looking pretty bad for Lan, but the rest of the team shows up at the last second with a spare spacesuit for him, saving his life. Which is once again a distraction, as Yuri steals Yai's ship while it's vacant, leaving the whole team stranded on a crashing spaceship. Thanks to a little good luck, Junk Data Man is nearby and attaches his debris to the spaceship, letting it safely re-enter the atmosphere before burning up. But how are they going to keep from crashing into the ground? Please, I'll make a parachute! Uh, Alright, that was pretty funny. Downtown, Misaki encounters Miss Yuri and tries arresting her, but she escapes and briefly holds Miss Mari hostage before getting herself hit by a truck. <laughs> Miss Mari ends up in the hospital after fainting and explains to her visitors that when she was a child, her father and sister were in an unexplained plane crash after it was struck by a meteorite. The plane was never found, so Miss Mari was convinced her sister had died all those years ago. Around the same time, Yuri escapes her prison van and makes it back to her secret subway base, where Laser Man suggests the accident freed her childhood memories. Convinced she will still get the job done, he gives her a dark synchro chip to take care of Miss Mari. She hides in the back of Misaki's car and makes him drive, telling him that the meteorite that struck her plane was called Duo, and that it sent two probes back to civilization, one being Yuri herself. This wound up making her weirdly superhuman, giving her healing powers at the cost of her long-term memory. And then she says after her dad died, she was studied and taken care of by Mr. Wily? And her DNA, altered by Duo, described technology far beyond human capability. I wonder if that's how World 3 got its start. Regardless, Yuri catches up to Mari, but is distracted by Misaki long enough for Lan to prepare to fight. The dimensional area consumes the bridge, and he cross-fuses with Mega Man while Yuri cross-fuses with Spike Man. Ms. Mari begs Yuri not to hurt the children, and forgives her for all she's done as an agent of Nebula, which turns out to be just enough to convince her to abandon her mission and keep Dark Proto Man from killing Mari himself. It all looks good until Dark Proto Man breaks her chest piece and knocks both her and Misaki off the bridge, resulting in this really emotional scream I was not expecting out of Ms. Mari. No! Oh. That was really sad. Yeah, I sure hope we get some resolution of that before something else- Hey look, Scilab finished their dimensional area generator and the vaccine chip. Chad's not convinced it'll work though and still thinks Proto Man blames him, refusing to let anyone else risk themselves getting hurt. Dark Proto Man shows up to destroy it, but unbeknownst to him, it was a setup. Generating a dimensional area of their own, the good guys navvies swarm the area and destroy Dark Proto Man's only exit. After a second failed attempt to absorb the Dark Aura, the vaccine chip is able to successfully break the Dark Chip- <laughs> But then it just regenerates. Chad finally gets fed up and simply lunges at Dark Proto Man, using his synchro chip to cross fuse into. What is that? What is that? Oh, Chad's trying to battle Dark Proto Man from within. I can relate. What? What do you think I spent like all of last year doing? Anyway, hey, look, baby child. We're gonna be best friends, and you'll be my Navi forever, right, Proto? Oh, fuck, okay, well, uh, Dark Proto Man tries to destroy the memory and Chode, but since they're fighting inside their cross-fused mind, it, it doesn't work, and Chode is able to approach and embrace him, finally bringing our favorite Proto Man back. Laser Man is pissed. He's the only one left, so he sends UFOs into Net City and abducts literally every single Net Navi. Millions of them, gone. At the same time, Bubble Man manages to capture Rush and bring him back to Shade Man, but he's followed by a bunch of the good guys. 
turns out, Shade Man knows about Rush's ability to move freely between the cyber world and the real one, and turns him into a Rush Synchro chip so he can do the same. What do you think about all this, Guts? Doggy. Awesome. Thanks. So Shade Man escapes into reality and starts destroying Dr. Regal's stuff and beating the unholy hell out of Lan until Regal finally reveals himself, unearths a massive underground skyscraper, and wraps a dimensional area around the entire planet. Shade Man attacks Dr. Regal, who uses the dark synchro chip to cross-use with Laser Man and... You know, wow, I just kind of want to hang here for a sec. This animation is really, really good here for some reason. Anyway, Regal finally gets the upper hand and just flat out deletes Shade Man. Hope you liked his arc, and also, ugh, that face, it's like a weird Akira thing. Say, remember that plane crash 15 years ago that we were talking about before? Yeah, it turns out the other probe of Duo was Dr. Regal himself, who gained near-infinite knowledge, allowing him to begin the groundwork for Nebula. That's great and all, but I'm not sure that matters much now, as he takes out the synchro chips he had Shade Man steal at the very start of the season to create a giant laser man and go all Godzilla on Dentex City. Lan tries to buy the other some time, but winds up exhausting himself by using five double souls while cross-fused with Mega Man. Thankfully, Chode is there to help out when Lan goes down. Meanwhile, Dr. Hikari is trying to pin down Laser Man's security protocol so they can jack directly into him, but the firewall address changes every time they look at it, so Rika has Search Man fire a tracker through the net at him, and the team fights wave after wave of viruses, with a few friends showing up at the last second. Even Bubble Man joins the fray in order to save his buddies Iceman and Spout Man, as well as to get revenge on Dr. Regal for deleting Shade Man. And in the final moments of the battle, the defeated Lan finds his body suddenly re-energized by the cheers of the imprisoned net navvies and goes full synchro, letting him toss the giant Laser Man around and shoot straight through it while Search Man does the same with his power source. Laser Man is defeated. Bubble Man returns Rush. There's some shooting stars and, uh, oh, hey, Yuri. And that's Mega Man NT Warrior Access. It's weird. This season really looked like it was going downhill. I mean, it took forever to get moving. But by the end, it, it actually got pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean... It didn't have a lot to do with Battle Network 4, but it did reincorporate the characters in kind of a neat way. It takes what was a pretty torturous game and turned it into a kind of neat season of TV. I mean, it would have been kind of nice if they didn't stray from the real plot too much, but that also might just be an issue of it being a 51-episode series more than anything else. And honestly, the dimensional area shtick got old very fucking fast. There were at least 40 dimensional areas across the 51 episodes in the season I counted. One episode has four all to itself. That's fucking ridiculous. And because the episodes kept wandering in and out of the real plot all the time, it took forever for most episodes to really get going, and it felt like half or more of each episode's 20-minute runtime was just wasted. And then there's the episodes not released in the West. I know this was a thing in the earlier seasons too, and yes, the show technically goes 37 straight episodes without losing one. Thanks, Canada. And yeah, the episodes weren't all that interesting, really, but we shouldn't be coming up on the finale missing five out of the last eight episodes. It's a mess. You know what, though? It was neat to see the Dark Chip subplot unravel with the Dark Lloyds finding themselves addicted to them and ultimately completely corrupted by them, like a disease or a steroid or something. And even though we didn't see much of the characters from the first two seasons, like Dex and Yai, the Net Agents, World 3, it feels nice to start fresh and try to build something unique with the series. Yeah, but World 3 was kind of cool. They can come back. Cool. Well, I think that's it, right? Yeah, I can't think of anything else. I'm good here. Man, it's kind of weird getting all the way through one of these things without something bad happening. Yeah. So, what are we going to do next? Uh, well, I mean, the show seemed pretty insistent on making the battle chip gate a thing, so I figured maybe next time we can do some real operation of our own. See you next time. When I gave those fools Battle Network 4, I never thought they'd make it through. It looks like I'll have to get a bit more... creative with my torture.